What the hell is that guy wearing on his face? We actually built this thing, and we made it right here in Vancouver. It looks kind of like a pair of uh, sunglasses, but it's actually a wearable computer with a built-in display. We made it for cyclists and runners, and the response around it has been pretty amazing. But let me ask you, would you personally wear this on your next bike ride? What if I told you it's not just a cool gadget? What if I told you it can actually make you safer? Let's say you're cycling. You need to have your eyes on the road, right? But let's say you're cycling and you get a text message, or you need to check the map to see where you're going. A lot of people will reach for their phone in the back pocket, and they'd be riding while looking at it. Now that's really dangerous. With this, you just glance down. There's a display right here. It powers on automatically. Gives you the information you need, and as soon as you look back up, the display switches off again. It's kind of like the speedometer in your car, only better because the display is only visible when you look at it, so it never competes for your attention. And compared to a smartphone, well, there's no comparison. First of all, you don't have to dig into your pocket or your bag. You don't have to unlock a screen or open the right app. And the road. Well, it's right there in front of your eyes, so you get the information you need without the safety trade-off. But let me ask you again: Would you personally wear this on your next bike ride? Would you bike around town with it? Some of you would, but I know what a lot of you are thinking: I don't want to look stupid. <laughs> I don't want people to look at me funny. I don't want to look like that weird guy up on stage. <laughs> Now, for people who are into cycling, and I'm one of them, we already wear this form-fitting kit. We already wear these scary-looking aero helmets. We already look like something out of Star Trek. Gear like this is a drop in the bucket, and that's why I'm still in business, thankfully. But for everyone else, for people who are not die-hard cyclists. Being afraid of looking stupid—it's a huge thing, and it's not just about eyewear. Now, there's this problem with men in my family, and let me preface by saying I'm probably next. But there's this problem with men in my family when they reach a certain age, people around them have to speak louder and louder, and have to repeat themselves a lot. It just gets worse and worse. A certain time, you have to sit them down and go, "Hey, listen." We've noticed you have real trouble hearing sometimes. They make these great high-tech hearing aids; you can barely see them. Why don't we go down and pick one out? The response, at least initially, is always no, no way. I mean, wearing a hearing aid would mean a tremendous increase in quality of life, but for them, the cost in terms of their physical appearance, in terms of what other people think, it's too high. They'd rather ask people to speak up, and it's not just about hearing aids. That's just the tip of the iceberg. People put a lot on the line when they put their physical appearance first. I mean, think about how many cyclists die or get injured each year because they refuse to wear a helmet. So, wanting to look cool has a price. Vanity has a price, and that price can be pretty high. So why do people pay? Are we just that stupid? Are we just that narcissistic? Well, sometimes. But mostly, we just want to present the best possible versions of ourselves. We want to look good so other people think highly of us. We want to be respected. We want to be admired. We want to belong. That's basic social behavior. I mean, think about it. When do we wear our oldest, rattiest clothes? When we're home on the couch, lounging by ourselves. When do we wear the best clothes we'll ever wear? When we get married, because every person we know is in that room with us, and that's what person means, by the way, from the Latin word persona and actor's mask. And like all good actors, we need to be in the right costume for the character we play.
But here's the thing. The, our perception of what the right costume is, that can change. It can change very quickly, and it can change in really surprising ways. There's a lot of men in the audience today. How many of you are wearing a wristwatch? Quite a few. I'm wearing one. What if I told you that 100 years ago, we would have all been called sissies? Here's a newspaper clipping from 1916. Sissyism is in the discard at Harvard, and the wristwatch must vanish. This is the edict of the student body, and a vigorous crusade is underway to have this objectionable emblem of effeminacy put out of commission for the time being. A hundred years ago, wristwatches were women's jewelry. They've been around for a long time, and they worked really well. Men didn't want to have anything to do with them. Instead, actually, we had to carry these things. So we had to carry around a pocket watch, and we had to carry them at the end of a chain, because if we dropped it, that was it. Your watch was dead. If you wanted to know the time, you'd have to ask your wife, because she was the one wearing the wristwatch. <laughs> Now that must have been completely insane if you were a woman back then. Here you were with the perfect solution on your wrist to the problem. Yet men were saying, "That's too girly. That's stupid. If you were a man, you'd understand." So when did men come to their senses? Turns out it was the First World War. When you're fighting in the trenches, a pocket watch can get you killed. It's too heavy, it's too bulky, it's way too easy to drop, and you can't really access it and use a rifle at the same time. This is bad news. Watch manufacturers. They realized this. They came out with the trench watch, which was really a wristwatch with these canvas straps and metal covers. Officers started wearing them, then soldiers did, and soon enough, the wristwatch became just a standard piece of military hardware. In 1918, the war ended. All these soldiers, all these officers, they came home, and they brought their wristwatch with them. They started wearing them at work. They started wearing them out shopping, just walking down the street. Did people look at them and go? Wow, what a bunch of sissies! No, of course not. These guys were heroes. So the way we saw the wristwatch, it changed. The wristwatch became a cool accessory for men to wear. So today we see these full-page ads in the magazines, showing you know, Daniel Craig or George Clooney putting on these manly poses with wristwatches, and we go, "Yeah." That's sexy. That's cool. So while we're all guided by our vanity, our concept of what looks cool, our concept of what's appropriate to wear, is completely relative, and it can change very quickly. The history of the wristwatch is a great example of that. Why am I telling you this? Because that thing right there is the future. Devices like that are going to be the solution to a real problem for all of us. Most of us check our phones more than a hundred times a day. Each time, we lose touch with the physical world around us. We don't hear what people are telling us. We don't see what's in front of us. At any given moment in the U.S., there are hundreds of thousands of people looking at their cell phones while driving. That's pretty scary. But we can't help it. We love data. We have an insatiable thirst for data, and the world is generating more and more of it every day. And if you think things are bad now, wait five years. 
in five years, your fridge is generating data. Your shoes are generating data. Your dog's color is going to be generating data. Everything is generating data. That's what the Internet of Things is. Every two days, more data is generated than was created from the dawn of time up until 2003. Every two days. Now think about how many times you look at your phone today. Now imagine in five years, it's giving you two, three, four, five times as much information. I mean, we just can't do it. We'd be constantly walking around like this, and the world would stop. Moving the display up here is a solution. That seems crazy, right? Having a display, a display right there on your face, that must be way more distracting, right? But it's not. It's actually the opposite. When you try it, you realize information is easier to get to. Your interactions are much shorter. You don't lose sight of what's in front of you. If you get a text message, you quickly glance down and go about your day. There's no interruption. So in my mind, it's crystal clear. In a world where 50 billion things are bombarding us with information, the next generation of wearable technology is the solution. It's the only way all this data can make our lives better instead of overwhelming us completely. But soon, there's going to be a showdown. One side is going to hold us back, the other is going to be the path forward. But to actually take that path forward, we're going to have to deal with our vanity. We're going to have to deal with the fact that we don't always value safety and convenience as much as looking cool. But here's the thing. What looks cool is relative. It's subjective. It's cultural. And if the conditions are right, it can change on a dime. So remember the history of the wristwatch and be open-minded. Trust me, I know what's coming. And being open-minded is going to pay off big time. Thank you.